7-Eleven. Now, there's a name most of us know. The 7 is just the number, but the 11 is spelled out. It makes for a cool looking logo. On July 11th, or 7-Eleven, each year they've been having this big promotion where they give away free Slurpees. July 11th has become known as 7-Eleven Day. It's nice when the name of your business corresponds with the date on the calendar. Just think about that. First off, the name has to consist of two numbers. The first number has to be between 1 and 12, and the second number has to be between 1 and 31, or 30, or 28, depending on the first number. So, since the very existence of 7-Eleven Day is practically a miracle, it'd be cool for me to release a video about them on 7-Eleven. I've certainly been getting enough requests saying that I should do it. But the issue is, I only release videos on Wednesdays. Now we need a second mini miracle to make 7-Eleven fall on a Wednesday. Well, it happened this year, and I completely ignored it. JetFan92 even told me about it a week in advance, so I can't claim I didn't know. I just had my mind set on Hallmark, and I released a video about them instead. Then I realized that July 11th won't fall on a Wednesday until 2029, and I'm not waiting that long. JetFan92 was understandably disappointed in me for letting it pass, but then informed me that 11-7 is also on a Wednesday. <laughs> now, I know it's not as good, but it's the best remaining option within the decade. So today is 11-7, and I'm talking about 7-Eleven. I say most of us know the name because there's so many of them. I found this location locator on their website and have been messing with it for far longer than I care to admit. Just typing in a somewhat large city and watching all the little pins appear. Just look at the Los Angeles area, and then you move it a little and get a bunch of new pins to show up. Here's a map provided by 7-Eleven of their US locations. Doesn't seem to be much of a pattern, except the East and the West Coasts have a ton of them, and states without any seem to be more toward the middle. In total, their US locations add up to over 9,000, but that's only the beginning. Globally, they're reaching 70,000. To put that into perspective, that's almost twice as many as McDonald's. There's over 20,000 in Japan alone, 9,500 in South Korea, almost 11,000 in Thailand? That's three countries that have more 7-Elevens than the United States. I'd say they've done a terrific job expanding globally. I'd say they've been pretty successful overall. Now, the way you envision 7-Eleven is highly dependent on which of these countries you're from. The stores in Japan are different from those in Canada, and those are different from China. These 5,300 locations in Taiwan are far different than anywhere else. The citizens pay bills and traffic tickets there, and some even offer health health screenings. But the focus here is on the United States, and generally speaking, I came up with a few things that we associate with 7-Eleven. I think most people, even outside of the US, would agree with the list. They have snacks and food, they're always open, generally 24 hours, they're seemingly everywhere, many have gas stations attached, and the Slurpees of course. When I say 7-Eleven, that's what comes to your mind, right? Well, you might be surprised to hear that when this company started, it didn't have any of these. So let's take a look at how they transformed into what they are today. In 1927, which is over 90 years ago, there was a company in Dallas called the Southland Ice Company. As the name suggests, they sold ice. Big blocks of ice. See, before everyone had electric refrigerators, they had ice boxes. It's essentially a large box with blocks of ice in it to keep the surrounding food cold. Cold. Naturally, these blocks would melt away and have to be replaced. If you lived in the Dallas area in 1927, you'd be able to do this at the Southland Ice Company. There was a man named Jefferson Green that ran the day-to-day -day operations at one of these locations. His thought was that alongside the ice, they could start selling a few essentials. Just milk and eggs and mostly things that would be brought home and placed inside your ice box alongside the ice. It was convenient, no need to go to the crowded grocery store and wait behind people buying who knows what when you just needed something basic. Jefferson presented that idea to one of the owners and he was open to it. Once they started offering all of this stuff, it was thought to be the very first convenience store. And a good thing it was, I'd hate to think of where they'd be today if they had refused to expand from their ice sales. The switch into the store that we know today wasn't as fast as you may be picturing. Their focus was still on ice for many more years. There was a huge 
huge spike in demand for it during World War II and after it with all the soldiers returning home to a point where they started acquiring other ice companies as a method of expansion to take advantage of this strong demand. But soon after they started that first convenience store in 1927, they did change their name. Not to 7-Eleven, they changed it to Totem Stores. Now, hold on, it does make sense. One of the managers had this random idea of sticking a totem pole in front of one of their busy locations, thinking maybe it'll be noticed and attract a few customers. Because of this, people started referring to it as the totem store. Not only because of the totem pole, it was sort of a play on words. People tote away their giant ice blocks. The word tote means to carry, like you know, like a tote bag, totem store, you get it. Yeah, I know, it doesn't sound all that clever right now, but the name caught on so much so that the company actually made it their official name, and it stayed that way for almost 20 years. In 1946 is when they changed it to 7-Eleven. It was their store hours, open from 7 in the morning till 11 at night. At the time, those were thought to be insanely long operating hours. Making it their name was a means to advertise that they're open for those uncommon common hours, but it also helps show their commitment to the customers. As if to say, we're here even when others aren't kind of a thing. Along with the name change, they started putting a greater emphasis on the convenience store part of their business. This is evidenced by the fact that they doubled the floor space in their stores. And today, their name doesn't even make much sense anymore. They're not open from 7 to 11, they're generally known to be open for 24 hours. That stems back to 1962 in an Austin location. The story goes that a University of Texas football game had just ended late one night, and everyone went to a 7-Eleven afterward and the location chose to stay open through the night. It gave that particular location the motivation to experiment with the idea of staying open for 24 hours and soon others saw the benefits and tried it out as well. In the late 1970s, it became fairly standard. 7-Eleven is thought to be the very first 24 hours convenience store. So at this point, they're now called 7-Eleven, they've placed an ever increasing emphasis on their convenience stores, but they're still in tech. Texas haven't expanded too far from Dallas yet. That started in the later 50s when they opened some stores around Pennsylvania and that area in the east. Over the next couple of years, they continued expanding, mainly by acquiring competing convenience store chains throughout the United States, as well as franchising. Throughout the 1970s, they started doing all of this internationally. By the end of that decade, they had a presence in Canada, Mexico, the United Kingdom, as well as Japan. As I mentioned, their largest presence today is in Japan, and in 1990, it was actually sold to a Japanese company after a bankruptcy. I can go into more details detail about that one in the future. Now, as far as their involvement in gasoline, things always tend to get involved when you're talking about gasoline, but I'll try to keep it simple. They actually started experimenting with it back when they were still called Totem, but their involvement became much heavier in the 1970s. Somewhat related, they bought a company called Chief Auto Parts, a chain of auto parts stores that soon grew to 465 locations. In the early 80s, they bought Sitco Petroleum Corporation for $780 million dollars so it can supply them with gasoline. It didn't quite go as well as they planned. They turned around and sold half of it a few years later, but signed a 20-year deal where they agreed to purchase a specified amount from them. That deal ended in 2006. I think that about covers it. That's their journey, from selling ice at a few locations in Dallas, Texas, to becoming the massive convenience store that we all know today. That's how. They entered the market of food and snacks, they got their name by operating long hours and eventually expanded it to 20 four hours. That's a brief overview of their expansion and involvement in the gas and automotive industry, as well as uh, the Slurpees. We haven't talked about the Slurpees. Real quick, it was invented in the late 50s, sort of by accident. I won't go into the whole story, but it found limited popularity until 1965 when 7-Eleven licensed the machine and started calling it a Slurpee. There, that should cover it. But can we take a minute to acknowledge how revolutionary this company has been throughout the years? As I already stated, they're thought to be the first convenience store, the first 24-hour convenience store, and according to their website, the first to offer ATM services and the first to sell coffee to go. That's an impressive list of firsts, considering that they're all things that we've come to expect in our everyday lives. What started as a very common local business selling ice has transformed into 
7-Eleven. Let me know in the comments, were you surprised to learn about this transformation, or better yet, were you impressed by it? I know this video was a little different from what I normally make, there weren't any figures or graphs, and I covered more ground, but not as in-depth, it felt. And that's because I view 7-Eleven as something that's unlike anything else, and I thought it'd be interesting to see how it got that way. Later on, I do want to make a more conventional video about that 1990 bankruptcy, which was actually their second bankruptcy. And any other thoughts you have about convenience stores, ice boxes, Slurpees, or those unique 7-Elevens in Taiwan, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Happy 11-7, and thank you for watching.